Alrighty, hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Yiga Mitzi, and this is Mitzi. Let's think about it. I have a special guest today, Allison, and she is going to be talking to us about being a bad widow. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, is that a thing? Apparently, it is. Allison is the main woman that is considered to be a bad widow. So, Allison, if you don't mind just describing, what does that necessarily mean, or just tell a little bit more about yourself? Okay, bad widow. I lost my husband to pancreatic cancer in 2016. And what I discovered immediately after that is that people have no idea how to deal with grieving, how to deal with death. And so I was very often treated like I might be contagious. Oh, that is different. Usually when I hear people just dealing with grief, they're just shunned or they're supposed to be quiet or they're supposed to be alone or they're supposed to just be crying in a corner in the dark and they're just supposed to be like that for months on end. How did you handle the grief? What did you do to get yourself back to normal or if there was a normal? (laughs) Yeah. So Bad Widow was about blowing up all those assumptions and actually telling the truth about the experience from inside the experience. Because after he died, I found out that nobody was talking about it from where I was. They were talking about things like, here's how you let go of stuff, and here's how you manage the finances. But there wasn't, how do you deal with fear, grief, anger, shame, crashing down all at the same time? How do you deal with losing your mind, losing memory, not being able to focus, not being able to connect with people? So people mean well. And so I had lots of people calling me, hey, what can I do for you? And I honestly was completely numb, just existing. And so I couldn't tell them what they could do for me because the only thing I wanted was I wanted my person back. I wanted them back and they couldn't do that for me. He died in my arms at home, but they couldn't bring him back. That's not, you know, we live in mortal bodies. At some point they end for all of us, Mm -hmm. right? But we don't live like that. At some point, all our lives will end. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that if you lose someone is you realize that life is short and it gets much more urgent to live it. Oh, I like that. I like the way that you state that, you know, that's a perfect, beautifully said quote, because not a lot of people do know how to adjust to that. And, you know, and like you said, how do you acknowledge the fact that, yeah, we're all mortal bodies. Everybody has a time date. Everyone's going to expire and just fall off the face of the earth, no matter how it is per sickness, death, spontaneousness, no matter what. And it's that readjustment to yourself as well as to your life to other people, to work, and just trying to figure out who you are again. And when you were trying to figure out who you were as an individual, because you were known to be his wife for so many years, yep. how did you find Allison back? What did you do to find Allison? Well, we were together for 25 years. So very close to half my life. Yeah, that's a long time. It's a long time. And when you're with someone for that long, there are a couple of things that happen. One of them is that you're a we more than you're an I. So this is the person that you consult. Hey, should we go out with? Hey, should we go out and do this? And so suddenly you're alone and making all these decisions by yourself. The thing that's really important to remember is that you're not the same person. So no matter how much the people around you and the people who love you would like you to go back to being who you were, because that's more comfortable for everybody. The person who's grieving and the people around them who love them. The fact of the matter is that's not possible. You will never be that person again. And so one of the deadly traps of grieving and of supporting someone who's grieving is wanting them to go back to being who they were Mm. because they can't. I just wish you could, I don't recognize you. And the person who's grieving, they're going along, they're existing. They're trying to put their feet on the floor each day and stay here. I would lie in bed and I would think of a reason to stay alive that day, something to enjoy that day before I put my feet on the floor, because it was that hard some days. I could even imagine. I honestly, I could not even imagine how hard that must have been just to try to just 
convince yourself to get up off the bed, to convince yourself you need to eat, to convince yourself, like get some yeah. fresh air. Cause I bet you, you were just dragging your feet and just feeling like there was an anchor just attached to you because you lost your significant other. You lost the man that you were with for majority of your life. And yeah. like you said, not a lot of people understand that they want you to go back to your old self, but your old self died when he died. You know, now you are a new Allison. Now you are a new person when you experience a death. It could, even if it's not a husband, it could be a mother, a brother, a sister, a family, yep. a distant relative, somebody that's close to your heart that had a big impact in your life. It truly affects you your whole entire life. There's no stopping mm -hmm. it, you know? So I totally understand with what you're saying and it makes perfect sense. Like it's hard to do these things. And was it just a repetitiveness that eventually helped you out of the system of that depression? I'm assuming you were in depression and you oh. were having those dark moments and stuff. I could only imagine, but is that yeah, safe to say? Very serious depression. Basically what I did was I kept having these things that didn't work and I kept coming up with solutions for them. I called mm -hmm. them nets. Okay. So for example, when my memory loss was so bad that I had five seconds from the moment I remembered I was hungry to get to the kitchen before I forgot again, mm -hmm. I put baskets of power bars around my apartment. So I would have a visual cue and I didn't have to rely so much on my memory because it was failing me. So the first thing was to kind of come back to myself outside of the role that I had as a wife, as a widow, as a whatever, who was I? Like what fed me as a person outside of everything that I'd lost? Because my husband and I had created this future together. Mm -hmm. We dreamed of this future together and it was gone. So I honestly didn't know what the future held for me. I didn't know if I would ever love again. I didn't know if I would get back my effectiveness and my capability because it was all lost. I mean, I felt like a shadow of my former self in everything. So the first thing was, how do I get back to myself? Mm -hmm. And that's something I call reconnect. Okay. And then the next thing was, how do I re-engage in the world? When we're hurt, any of us are hurt by any grief. And it could be loss of a home, loss of a job. It's not just loss of people that we grieve. And over the last two years, everyone is grieving something. And so how do you move forward through the grief if the entire planet is grieving? It's really an important conversation to be having. Mm -hmm. It really is because not a lot of people like to talk about it. They really don't. Mm -hmm. They avoid the topic and they start talking about, oh, the sky is blue. You're like, no, let's redirect ourselves, people, and really express what you're feeling. And I think that's the thing is that once people start to express what they're feeling, they start to feel vulnerable. They start to feel ashamed of their feelings because they feel that they should be feeling something else or they should be yep. acting in a different way. And then you get guilt coming in and then you get all of these other negative emotions that just coming on top and on top. And then anxiety has to come in just to throw it on the cherry on top. Anxiety has to be there to make you worry and make you stress about life and and money and just surviving, you know, because now it comes down totally. to surviving. And it sucks because when you put in that situation, people don't know how to survive. You know, people realize yep. that I don't know what to do. I don't know how to react. I don't know how to respond. And then they get in themselves into a shock. And then once you're in a shock, you might as well go into depression because it's like, I'm by myself now anyways, because by the time you put yourself in a shock mode, in a shock mentality, everyone around your circle left you alone, you know, they, or they push you away so that you can figure it out yourself, you know? And then right. once you're stuck figuring it out yourself, then it's like, what do I do? Because now I can't reach out to anybody or you feel like you're a burden because you're reaching out to somebody that's stressful. Like how did you overcome all of those obstacles? Yeah. All the expectations. You said it sort of at the top of our conversation. The expectation is that you'll be grieving for a long time. So what if in the first few months you laugh about something, then you get judged. Yeah. yeah. Right. So there's all these emotions and they're not all bad, but if mm -hmm. you experience something that's not grief, not anger, not some of these other ones, there's shame and there's judgment, mm -hmm. right? So you can't win. There's exactly. no way to win here. And the complicated thing is that, so for example, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, for example, when I decided that I was unwilling to live without love, that I was going to risk it again. If I felt a spark of desire, the grief rose in equal measure mm -hmm. at the same time. 
So we think about, well, you just experience chemistry, you just experience desire, you just experience joy by itself. But if you're grieving something, the grief rises at the same time because it's a moment of joy or a moment of desire that you're not going through with your person Mm -hmm. anymore. So the next thing was re-engage, make what I longed for a bigger life again, more people, more activities, bigger than my fear of the pain. And through this whole thing, I just kept saying to myself, this pain must serve. And there was that, that urgency. You have a life. He doesn't have a life anymore, but you have a life. So what are you going to do with it? That's good what question. Bad Widow was born out of. That, that's a good question. So did you have to ask yourself that almost every day or almost every moment that you felt like you were falling down to that slippery slope? Yeah. What am I bringing? So I have the gift of whatever days I have, and nobody knows how many there are. Mm -hmm. honestly. And so then it was, okay, re-engage. I knew that I couldn't do anything that I was qualified to do. So I couldn't coach because I didn't have the capacity to deal with people. I was an editor proofreader who had lost her memory and couldn't focus. So nothing I was qualified to do could I do. I decided I was going to push out, take a baby step in the area of work. Mm -hmm. And I worked in a Halloween pop-up store. Okay. That's nice up. though, because yeah, it distracts your mind. Sometimes people forget to realize that if you're just doing something simple and common and just mediocre work, as they say, then it actually, it's like a Zen feeling. You know, I've done some mediocre work and it's just calming sometimes just to refocus your mind on something just so simple, you know, doing the dishes at a job or just hanging up the costumes, you know, something so simple like that. So did that help you? It helped a whole lot because it was rather than wanting to do something that in that moment I couldn't do, I was doing something I could do and getting paid for it. So it felt good. That's good. To be expanding my capacity. And, you know, I was working a four hour shift because I was working for another widow who got it and I was exhausted at the end of four hours. But eventually I could do five hours, I could do six hours. And I had to, deliberately make a choice to push out for a bigger world because it wasn't going to happen by itself. Mm -hmm. And during these last two years, people have contracted, stayed home, gone out less, been with less people. And those people need to make a choice to push out. Then the next thing that I did was, and this is the stuff that I take my clients through. So you reconnect with yourself, you re-engage in the world, you pick something and take a baby step. And honestly, it doesn't matter what it is in what area of your life at all. Just pick something and then Mm -hmm. celebrate like it's, you know, a holiday because you did something like you did something huge and it may not feel huge, but it's big when you're contracted to do anything. And so celebrating it is really, really important to take the next baby step. Mm -hmm. So the next thing was reinvent myself. I wasn't the same person. I was some other person. So I had to figure out of all the things that I'd been doing across the last 25 years, which were mine. Oh, that's a good question. Especially Mm -hmm. when you've been in a relationship for so long and you've lost your single identity as just an individual. That is an amazing question just to ask yourself. Yeah. Wow. That's impressive. Well, especially because, you know, when you get into a relationship and it's all nice and sweet and there are things that you do that are their things. Yes. Because uh, I'm just going to go along because they like this so much. And then it gets set in stone and you're doing this thing you don't necessarily love. So reinvent was, okay. well, let me actually look at all of the various things I've done in the past by myself, with him. I love doing open mics, open mic singing. I write original poetry. I do open mic poetry. So I adore open mics. My husband didn't. So gradually, I was doing that less and less and less. And after he died, I took it back. Before he died, actually, I started to take it back. I participated in two. I had wanted to do be in cabaret shows, group cabaret shows, and sing. And so... I recognized that I needed to move the emotions through my body or I was not going to survive. That's smart. And for me, that's singing. For other people, it's other stuff. Could be exercise, could be walking in nature, could be dancing. It could be art. It doesn't Mm -hmm. matter what it is, but it's important to move the emotions through the body or they get stuck. 
And so I literally, after wanting to be on stages singing for 10 years, in the 11 months while he was dying, I was on four stages. And I used the songs, I chose the songs to remind myself that I wasn't just a caregiver while I was taking care of him. I wasn't just a widow. I wasn't just a wife. So one of the first songs I chose was I Am Woman. Oh, that's a beautiful one. That's a good one. And the Tuesday before the Saturday, he died in my arms at home. One of the songs I chose was I Will Survive, Gloria Gaynor. Hmm, that's good. That's really good. You have to sometimes just empower yourself, even if it's by the littlest mm-hmm. things, I always say. And because they make a big effect. I mean, look how they did. Yeah. You. I mean, just songs, just just expressing yourself in a way, just claiming it. You know, that's the biggest thing. You have to claim it for yourself. And once you claim it, you realize it's a possibility, you know, so exactly. That's nice that you were able to claim it for yourself and gain that possibility of you will survive. You will be the ultimate woman that you can be. I guess a question, because I know you kept on saying that you were having memory loss. Was yep. that due to the loss of your husband and the stress? Or was that just a separate condition that just ended up coming in? No, it was due to the loss of my husband and the stress of that. Now, one of the issues, one of the longer term issues about grief is that you stop trusting yourself. And so you have to actually take back trust in yourself, like trust in my body. My body failed me. I had no energy. I had no capacity to be with people, to do stuff. I lost my memory, my mind. And I lost my ability to focus. So standing on a stage and singing three songs and remembering the pattern that goes between them, that takes energy, focus, and memory. And sometime afterwards, I was doing something that required energy, focus, and memory. And I was very terrified that I would lose it all because it was so sudden. My husband died and suddenly everything went away. My body failed me. My mind failed me. Everything went away. and. After he died, I did another show and I got up on the stage and I forgot all the words that I'd been studying Wow! for months. That was terrifying to feel just like your heart dropped like, and I knew them, except suddenly that lack of trust in myself kicked in right up on the stage. And suddenly I had none of them anymore because I was so scared that I kicked right back into that protective mode. And so it can have kind of a long-term effect. Do I trust that I can really deliver this? Because there was a time when I couldn't, when legit everything went away. So that's something that happens as a longer term effect. Another thing that's really important to mention is that nobody understands who hasn't been through it, the timeline of grief. So people assume that you'll get through it in a year. The first year is numbness, is going through the motions, is just existing for the most part. It's overwhelming grief, lots of tears. And it's people who can't handle that leaving. What do you do when people leave? Do you take it personal? Is there a way for you not to take it personal? Or is is it just automatic? Like, how could you leave me in my time of grief or my time of need? But at the same time, do you even really want them around during your time of grief? You know, that's the biggest thing because me personally, I have one of my previous best friends, her husband died and- I kind of just stepped back because every time I made the initiative to try to reach out, she kind of just blew me off. And so I just took it as like, okay, she needs some time. She needs the time to just do her thing. So I just stepped back and let her do her thing. And I don't know when to step back in. That's my thing now. It's been a few Mm -hmm. months now and I haven't stepped back in. I kind of just let her do her thing. And I know that she's trying and I know that her immediate family and her other immediate friends are there too but they're constantly in her life and I feel like that's a little bit bombarding because I feel like she still needs to grieve and I don't want to be in her face all the time you know so I'm just stepping back you know so is that wrong to step back I have a really specific recommendation for you in those especially in those first months a lot of people were reaching out and contacting me and saying how can I help you Mm -hmm. And I had no idea. There was, I could not have told them how they could help me, but just getting that phone call or that text tethered me to the world. So she may not answer you, but if you from time to time, like once a month, just send her a text, Hey, just thinking about you, you know, when you're ready, no rush would love to talk. 
she'll reach back when she can. But if you keep reaching out, she'll know you're there when she's ready to reach back. Okay, that makes sense. And yeah, so that's what people don't understand. It's not even possible to respond for a while. Mm -hmm. It's really, really hard to get the energy to get out of bed, much less to reach out to another person. But it matters that you did. Mm-hmm. That makes so, sense from, yeah. from your perspective, because it's not like I had my husband die or someone really, really close to me die. So I'm not quite sure what they're going through. And it's best sometimes for me as an individual, I always try to push myself away or just give people space because I feel like space is the best healing. But sometimes it's not, you know, and hearing it from your perspective, it makes sense just to be a little like, throw it in the air. And if you want to catch it, catch it. But if not, then it's okay. It's there. And that makes sense. So it took time for you to reach out to those individuals that reached out to you as well. And And if you think about my memory loss, I didn't still don't, I still have trouble remembering when I last talked to people. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't keep reaching out, she won't remember that you reached out back when, Mm -hmm. because that time is all a blur. Yeah, that's true. Now in the second year, and so what happens very often is people crowd around in the early time and vanish later because they think you're probably getting better at that point. Mm -hmm. To stay, to keep them connected to the world, to keep me connected to the world, those people who just kept saying, hey, I'm here, were invaluable. The first year is grief. And if you can let the people be how they are, So if they want to go out and just have a nice meal and talk about anything or share memories or laugh for a minute and not be judged by it, that is a great gift. If you're willing to be with them when they need to cry, understanding that they're not broken, they're just tears. Is it a taboo to bring it up again? You know what I mean? Like the first year or second year, like, is it a taboo? I would assume, I'm just assuming at this point, I would assume that it would be wrong to just bring up how you're dealing with the death. You know what I mean? Like, that sounds a little like I'm poking the bear. Like, no, it's not at all. No, no. I mean, the bear is the only thing that person is aware of. If you're ignoring the bear, you're ignoring their entire reality. Oh, that's smart. I like the way that you put that. That's true. Because at the end of the day, they're always thinking about it. them. They're always going to have them in the back burner just right there. Because in my mind, I would assume that you never really adjust with them out of your life. No matter how many years go past or how many months, days, hours, time frame, it never really adjusts to having that person that was always there day in and day out, out of your yep. life. So to not bring them up would kind of be an, of an insult. But... Yeah, it's just, it makes them feel completely alone because it's so big for them and you're just ignoring that reality. Now, what you can do is you can say, hey, how do you want me to deal with this? Shall we share, shall I share stories of you and your husband that I have? That's sometimes nice. Do you want to not talk about it? Do you want, just want a hug? I'll do whatever you need. You know, so in not wanting to get it wrong, you're disconnecting yourself from it yeah. and you mean well, but mm-hmm. what it does is it leaves the person isolated. So the first year is numbness, just existing, trying to get through the day and people pile on for the, the first three to six months. The second year, everybody leaves because they think you're back, but you're not back mostly. Second year is zero to rage in five seconds, or at least that's what it was for me and a lot of the people I've talked to. Because in the second year, it gets real. In the second year, it's, I will never be able to see or touch this person ever again. They don't exist in the world. So when you go through those rages, do you accidentally take it out on the people that are around you? And then- Absolutely. How do you deal with that? I would assume asking for forgiveness would be inappropriate because you are dealing with something that's still reoccurring in your mind. It's haunting you at this point. You know, it's right there eating at your brain, just reminding you that you're alone or he's not there or they're not there. And it's just constant repetitiveness. And it's just, how do you really just silence that? Well, you don't. I mean, the thing that's so toxic about grief is we don't talk about it. And so there's not really the space to say, Yes, I just lashed out. I really apologize. And this was really present when I started dating. So I had not dated since 1992 and it was 2018. And in the dating game has totally changed. (laughs) Totally changed. 
totally changed. And I decided, okay, I'm going to, I have no energy for people still, but I want to start including men in my world. I had a lot of female friends and I was good at, you know, communicating what was going on so that they would reach out to me. But when I start, when I, I got on Bumble, which is an online dating app, and I just described myself as clearly as I could. And then I treated it like a marketing campaign. Mm -hmm. I saw what responses came in and I didn't meet anyone until I was getting the kinds of responses that I wanted from the men that I wanted to meet. Was it hard for you when you were going back into the dating game to disconnect yourself from your husband and how he was? When I say disconnecting, meaning like you weren't trying to find another man that was exactly like your husband. That's what more so is what I'm asking. I wasn't. So the way that I framed it was that I was looking for my second epic love affair. Oh, that's different. That is very nice. That's hey, you're being blunt. You're being honest. They can't be mad at you. They can't say that you were there was a sneaky plan agenda. No, you were just there, like looking for a second love. <laughs> looking for a second love, and and so I wasn't. I wasn't looking at bank accounts or heights or eye color or anything. I was interested in meeting someone who wanted me exactly as I was. So. In my profile, I described myself, I said I was a widow. I said things like, I prefer rocky beaches to sandy ones. So if someone's idea of joy is the tropics, they're not my person. And I wanted them, I had no energy. So I wanted them to deselect themselves if they weren't my person. Yeah, I didn't even want to talk to them. (laughs) This is my survey. This is my application. Please fill it out. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't, well, you know, thank you for your time. (laughs) Exactly. But nobody's wasting time and they know exactly what they're getting, except they didn't because I was a hot mess. Absolutely a hot mess. Now, I found my second love of a lifetime within six months from when I started actually seeing someone online dating, which was not a thing in 1992. No, I couldn't imagine. You meet somebody (laughs) face to face back then. My next question is, once he passed, how long did it take for you to actually put yourself out there? It took you six months from actually finding someone once you started a date and you started to, when you made that mental decision in your mind to put yourself out there to date and open your heart again. But how long did it take for you from him passing to you finding your second love? So he died September 10th, 2016. And I went on my first date with the man I'm with now on July 1st of 2018. Oh, okay. So it did take you time. It It took time. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily like it was six months after he died. Like I got on the bandwagon, like, hey, how you doing? No, you did give yourself time to grieve. You did give yourself time to just realize that it's time to love you again. And it's time to allow other people to love you again. And I think that's a hard step to take, isn't it? I mean, to put yourself back out there. It was brutal because that feels like if I had one epic love affair, how dare I go for another? How dare I? And it's the biggest feeling of betrayal to feel desire to love someone again. I was a hot mess and I was accustomed to only this one person's lips kissing me, arm around my waist, only how he felt, how Mm -hmm. his skin felt against my skin. And so I couldn't trust my chemistry. I literally had a get away from me reaction when someone would try to touch me, even Mm -hmm. if I wanted their arm around my waist, even if I wanted them to kiss me, there was this get back. Push back. Yeah. Push back. That makes sense. That makes perfect sense why that would be because now you have to remind yourself it's okay. Now you have to tell yourself and speak to yourself. And that's when Mm -hmm. people don't realize like you have to coach yourself sometimes through things. And especially through these difficult times of death and grief, you, you have to be your biggest coach, your biggest supporter and your biggest cheerleader, as they say, because at the end of the day, it seems like no matter how many times people outside of your circle, outside of just you, no matter how much they try to be your coach and try to be your cheerleader it doesn't make no difference as long as you are your own cheerleader and you are your own coach yeah I mean I literally I had to be what I knew was that if I was willing to risk love again and if I wanted to actually get that epic love affair that second one 
I needed to push through my own discomfort. And in this moment, and we've been talking about this in one way or another through the entire conversation, it was so critical for me to communicate. And so when I'd have one of these weird reactions, I felt desire, he felt desire, and I'm like, get away. Mm -hmm. Crazy, crazy. I had to ask myself, is it me? Is it him? Or is it us? Because that gave me my next action. Then I knew what to do next. If it was me, I had to deal with me. He couldn't do anything about that. And I had to communicate clearly. So when I did something like this, and this is to your point about, well, what do you do when you get angry or you burst into tears or whatever? Basically, apologize and explain and ask forgiveness. Mm -hmm. That's it. Not forgiveness like I was wrong or bad, but just, I really forgive you. I really ask that you forgive me because I'm having this reaction and my feelings are all confused. And this is what's happening. My boyfriend is amazing. So there was a time, my husband died in September. Our anniversary, what would have been our 20th anniversary was October. Thanksgiving, his birthday in December, Christmas in December, New Year's. So I had a lot of really rough anniversaries in that time frame. Around October, I said to this guy who was starting to become important to me, I said, you know, you may not want to see me again till January. Let's just take some time. I have these anniversaries. I'm going to be really a mess for the next few months. You mm -hmm. may want to skip this part of the journey with me. <laughs> and then two days later, <laughs> I called him up and I said, hey, my cousin is doing a movie premiere at MoMA and I'm going with my mom. Do you want to come? So two days after I said, don't see me till January, the poor man was probably having whiplash. He's like, what is wrong with this lady? <laughs> but it was like that. You know, it was like that. He was important to me. I knew he was important to me. And there were all these feelings and emotions. He was patient. It sounds like he was very patient with you. And it sounds like to deal with somebody who is grieving, you have to be patient. You have to be yep. very, very patient and very understanding and very accepting at that because you have to accept what they're going through, acknowledge what they're going through, validate what they're feeling, as well yep. as everything else that comes in between to be able to gain that comfortability again. Because I bet you it took a long time to even still feel fully comfortable, but you at least had an idea like, you know, that could be my person. <laughs> yeah, it took a long, long time. Come Christmas, we were both in the place where we knew this was something and this was something important, but we had not been intimate. I had gotten to the point where we could kiss each other without my having a panic attack. Oh, wow. That's amazing. I'd gotten there. But if we were going to move in together, we needed to know if that worked. That's even a bigger step too. Oh, really, really, really scary. And so we made this deal. We would go away for the weekend to Tarrytown, which is, you know, 10 minutes from where my mom lives in case it went really <laughs> badly and be, stay in a hotel. And the only rule was one room, one bed. And I would try. Yeah, you have to. I mean, you have to tr at least give yourself the benefit of the doubt that you tried. And I bet right. you that, that took a lot of coaching in yourself. I bet you were it was, telling yourself, like, we need to do this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was literally, you know, just increase the, the level of intimacy until I hit a panic attack. And then mm -hmm. stop, go have a meal, go, go for a walk, go to the pool. And I literally, I had been told that for every widow, the first time after you cry. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to just have a really good hard cry right at the beginning and then I'll be done. Yeah. No, it not how, like that. It might happen like that for some people. Like it's really individual. Like some people start dating faster than I did. Some people take longer. Some people never do. It's whatever the person going through it wants, honestly, is there's no right anything. And so I wound up pressing into my own discomfort till I hit a panic attack, calling stop, at which point we would stop. And then once I was able to gather myself again, pressing back into it again at a deeper level. And it worked. I mean, it worked beautifully, actually. That's and we've now been together for over three years. Oh, that's a blessing. That is nice. But the communicating through the hot mess piece was essential for how strong our relationship is now. I wound up writing a book, which is a best-selling book called The Bad Widow Guide to Life After Loss, Moving Through Grief to Live in Love Again, which is all these stories. And also, this is how I did it. This is how someone who's grieving or someone who wants to support them can 
help them through. Smart. So from my understanding, from our basically our whole conversation, it sounds like the mm-hmm. reason why you call yourself a bad widow is because, I mean, well, you pushed yourself out of yep. those norms or out of those stigmas that people portray. And you pushed yourself to go back out there and to go back to work. You pushed yourself to get out of bed. You pushed yourself to do all of these things that society has already closed you off from. Because right. it seems like society, as soon as your partner dies you slowly die right after, you know? It's always those stigmas like, oh, it's so sweet. He died and then she died. Like, no. How about the stories of it's so sweet that he died, but she survived, you know? Because it sounds like you've survived because that's what it comes down to. You survived all of those stigmas. You survived not killing yourself and you survived the depression. You survived the anxiety. You survived all that. Yeah, it took time and you're still working on it because it's a never ending working process. But- The fact that you are trying and you're putting yourself out there is that bad widow stigma or, you know, so am I in the right lines? You're in the right lane. You know, the other thing that's bad widow is nobody talks about grief. So I talk about grief and Mm -hmm. I talk about it from the inside and I talk about it from the ugly. Mm -hmm. So in my book, there are things that I did wrong. There are people that I, that went away and they went away because I did stupid stuff sometimes Mm -hmm. in my grieving. I mean, if you don't mind me asking, what's considered to be stupid stuff? In my mind, I wouldn't be able to know what is the stupid stuff. Like, how what is considered the inappropriate, the wrong way of grieving? Yeah, it's after someone dies, especially, you need so much support. Emotional support, spiritual support, financial support, all kinds of support. And the thing that I did wrong, if you will, is that there were times, especially... Asking for money feels shameful. Not being able to make it on your own when you're incapacitated feels shameful. And so there were some times when I waited until I was in a desperate position, as opposed to talking to people before I got there. So asking as a victim so that people felt crunched into a corner, like they had to give me what I was asking for. Right. As opposed to I am a resourceful human being. I will figure this out. I am not a victim. And actually talking to people as I was going through it in a way that empowered them to help me, but didn't make them feel like they had to. Yeah. Without that guilt trip along with that question. Yeah. And nobody wants to get it wrong. So making people feel bad if they don't is not a kind thing to do, even if you're Mm -hmm. grieving. So that's Mm -hmm. what I would say I did wrong at times. And one of the things I'm proudest of about this book is that I didn't sugarcoat what it was really like. That's good. That's really good because people need to get away from that sugarcoat. People need to get away from it because one, it's your experience. It's all yeah. about your experience. So people shouldn't get offended from your own experience and your own triumphs and your own obstacles. And I think that's the, another thing that people don't like to talk about is that when people write, because I'm an author as well, when people write and they write out of their heart, they write out of their experience, they write out of their emotions, they write out of what they feel. And yeah. as soon as somebody else reads it and they get offended by it, now you're wrong for feeling feeling that way. You're wrong for experiencing it. You're wrong for doing all of this other stuff. And it doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it right at all. People need to acknowledge it as is, you know, but that's just my opinion. (laughs) Yeah, no, I totally agree. But to have that happen, you have to actually talk about it. You have Mm -hmm. to talk about what the grief is really like, not what people who've not been through this kind of thing think it's like. Because what winds up happening, it's really hard to make decisions after your person dies. Because you've been making decisions together for a while. And Mm -hmm. so it feels like, would that person like the choice that I'm making here? So it shows up like being very confused. And into that confusion, people want to help. So they give their advice. And the advice that they give is, this is what I think I would want if I was in that position, except that I've never been there. So I have no idea what I'm talking about. 
Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Because I think that's another mm -hmm. reason why I pushed myself away from my friend is because of that statement right there, because yeah. I'm afraid of giving her advice or giving her my opinion in a situation that I have no experience in. And I feel that that would make me ignorant and not caring of her emotions because of that. And I feel like it's wrong of me to even state any type of opinion when I have no experience in that. I can't tell you I understand because I really don't understand. And to say that I don't understand right. sounds arrogant and sounds conceited and it sounds wrong and it sounds selfish and it sounds just like I'm being mean and careless when I'm trying to show that I care. But in reality, it's like it's coming off the wrong way. Well, you can legitimately say, I want you to know that, that I care and I don't necessarily know how to what handle to the do. situation. Yeah, because that's basically what to do. it. But I have a really specific piece of recommendation for you and for anyone who's in this situation. When you get a chance to actually go and hang out with that person, just have a conversation and allow them to talk about what's going on. Hey, mm -hmm. what's been happening this week? And make it a short time frame, okay? Because how are you doing is unanswerable. It's very bland. It's very open. Like, how are you doing? Like, what do you mean? How am I doing? I'm, I'm surviving. I'm trying, trying to deal with life. And it's just, right. uh, that's not a question that people want to answer when they're grieving. Let's be honest. No, that's kind of like, it's a, not. you're poking the bear. <laughs> well, you can't answer it, but you can yeah. answer. How are you doing today? How are you doing this week? So if you give it a short time parameter, that can be answered. So when you get a chance to actually have a conversation, just listen to what's happening. Hey, how's this week been with a limited time parameter? Listen to, to what's happening and then make a suggestion of how you can support them based on what they said. That makes sense. Okay. Like if they have kids, hey, could I take the kids for a couple of hours? And then they have time. So maybe they just need to take a shower and cry in the shower without frightening their children. That makes sense. And then if they say yes, you execute it. So you're not asking, how can I help you? You're saying, hey, you said this. Would it be helpful if I did this? Smart. And they can say yes or no. But that's the way that people who are supporting someone who's grieving can really provide practical support that's not their own good idea, but that's actually a real thing. Yeah, that's perfectly said. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I'm pretty sure there's somebody in my audience that's listening to this. It's going to be listening to this and they're going to really reflect on this because let's be honest, there's a lot of people like me who are ignorant mm -hmm. in the matter of grief and dealing with somebody who's dealing with grief and they're making all the wrong mistakes. Maybe we should write a book, how you're doing all of it wrong, right? <laughs> and then, well, basically I say what goes wrong and how to do it right in my book. Smart, smart. Just read Bad Widow, y'all. Just go to read Bad Widow. Find it. Amazon, Barnes and Noble. I bet you you can find it. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> That's awesome. Awesome. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to share with the audience before we wrap this up? I am doing a free monthly workshop called Reconnect because one of the most important things that I have to offer out of my work with the whole world grieving is how do you get back out there? How do you get back out there if you're a widow or widower? But how do you get back out there when we've had smaller worlds, less people around, less interactions, less activities? How do you get back out there? And so Reconnect is this monthly series about ways to do that just reconnecting in the world. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank exactly. you. I think what you're doing is awesome. The fact that you've written a book to help other people so that they can see and hear and just experience your own experiences, you know, through this time is very important. And the fact that you're able to share your testimony with the world, I applaud you for that because that's a difficult thing to do. You know, that's a difficult thing for people to try to even overcome and just even put themselves to even share their testimony because they feel like it's so private that they don't want to experience expose themselves and their story and their experiences to the world, you know, but without realizing that people's testimony helps somebody else's, you know, because what you've yeah. already been through, somebody is going through right now as we speak. And 
if they are going through right now as we speak, then they should be able to have that outlet or they should be able to know where to go and have that a certain direction who are going through what you are going through. And thank you for being that direction for people. And thank you for being there and helping the other ones because it's a never ending situation of what you're going through. And I thank you for that because it takes a lot. And I'm pretty sure you feel like a big chunk of you is already outside of you and and you're not exposed, you know, you're not vulnerable and you no longer have that shame that was put in there beforehand. So I thank you for all of that. I mean, you are someone that I'm going to recommend for many other people as well as for myself. I'm going to get that book because obviously (laughs) I need to learn how to deal with grief for other people and for myself because, hey, someone's going to die one day. And I need to know how to respond. I need to know how to react. I need to know how to deal with this before it comes all bombarding on my face. Because I bet you it felt like an atomic bomb when it happened. It's like everything was affected in a mile radius. (laughs) So I can't stop thanking you because it was a very great conversation that we were able to have. It enlightened me and it helped me see grief in a different perspective. And I hope my audience who's listening and who's watching our video, that they're able to have that same experience as well, because it's important that we need to break this taboo of not talking about grief and talking about death and how to overcome it. Because I don't think that there is a way to really deal with it properly. And everybody's going to be considered to be a bad widow because there's no real right way of doing it you know so thank you thank you thank you thank you (laughs) thank you for having me on (laughs) 